Thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction. Um, of course, uh, I can't pretend that I wasn't around in 1969 now. Uh, but um, we, what, this is uh, uh, a very uh, exciting theme for our uh, July lectures this year uh, because there are so many uh, important uh, aspects of physics that were involved in the uh, moon missions. Uh, so I want to start... Um, uh, uh, so what I want to do tonight is uh, cover uh, two important aspects. First, the very unusual fe uh, features of the Earth-Moon system. And I've uh, called it the double planets because the Earth has an unusually <coughs> large moon. And then uh, in the second part of the, theater, uh, the lecture, I want to talk about uh, the physics of uh, getting to the moon very superficially because uh, Professor Klein will come in and uh, uh, give you the full details in the uh, last lecture in the program, so don't miss that. Um, so, uh, this is the anniversary we're celebrating. Uh, for those of you who were not around in 1969, are there anybody, any people here who were not around in 1969? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, 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 great. great. It's, it's very difficult to convey for those of us who were around in 1969, just how exciting this was and how it dominated the media and everything. You couldn't, go, you couldn't fail to hear about the excitement of the lead up to the moon mission and then the whole world stopped uh, while uh, it was underway in July of 1969. And of course, uh, we tuned in, those of us who were around at the time, I was only 11 years old, through this exciting medium of television, which united us all. Um, so, let me, let me now uh, start at the beginning, uh, the first observations of our, of our moon. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, moon has uh, uh, been a feature of uh, human culture since uh, deep antiquity. And uh, I've chosen to start with this uh, the nebula sky disk, which was discovered by uh, people with metal detectors and attempted to be sold on the uh, black market uh, before it was intercepted by the German authorities in uh, eastern Germany. Uh, it dates from uh, 1600 BC and it includes uh, a, a representation of the present moon. Uh, the disk is probably the sun. Uh, the cluster of gold dots is probably the Pleiades, and there are two gold arcs, one of which uh, is missing, uh, which seem to represent uh, the variation in the rising of the sun uh, with the seasons uh, relative to the horizon around the edge of the disk uh, for that part of uh, Germany at that latitude. And uh, it's quite a uh, hefty object. Uh, that's uh, that's not the actual object that I'm holding here in the museum, that's a replica, uh, but it's, uh, I've seen the original in the museum and, uh, out in the field where it was discovered. They now have this uh, stainless steel dome that reflects the sky, of which this is obviously uh, some representation. And the curved arc at the bottom there is thought to be some kind of heavenly boat. Uh, we fast forward to uh, ancient Greece, and I'm grateful to Professor Klein for sending this to me uh, during the week. Uh, where uh, slowly it was realised the moon uh, was uh, similar to the Earth in that it was a, a, an object with uh, surface topography and in fact possibly even made of rock. Uh, but it was a bit risky claiming that a heavenly object was made of rock. Uh, two and a half thousand years ago, uh, the world wasn't quite uh, ready for that. Uh, and it's generally agreed that the first uh, scientific observations of the moon were at least recorded uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, this year is the 500th anniversary of uh, his death in 1519, and there's this very nice uh, exhibition, uh, Design the Future, featuring some of his work presently on uh, in uh, Turin in northern Italy, which I had the pleasure of attending last month. But if, if you look at some of the pages of his copious manuscripts, uh, you find detailed diagrams 
uh, illustrating the relative position of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun in order to explain the monthly uh, progression of the seasons as the Moon waxes and wanes. And you'll notice if you look at the diagrams carefully, this is the geocentric model of the solar system that Da Vinci is using in an attempt to explain the observations of the phases of the Moon. And that model of the solar system needed a whole lot of fudges in order to explain the relative position of the heavenly bodies and the illumination of them, of them by the sun. Uh, he also sketched these uh, maps of the moon uh, and explained the phenomenon of earth shine where the sun reflected off the earth and illuminated uh, the dark parts of the moon. And maybe the first sketches of what now are called the lunar seas. But then we fast forward uh, to Galileo, uh, my hero, uh, who did the first telescopic observations uh, of the moon and reported them in his uh, sidereal uh, messenger. The first time uh, an astronomical telescope was focused on the moon. And Galileo reported an avalanche of new discoveries about the moon. He could see mountains, he could see craters, he could see all sorts of features. You could see that the moon had topography like the Earth, uh, and this uh, came as a great surprise. Uh, folks, there's a, a few chairs left down, uh, seats left down this uh, far corner of the uh, looking for us somewhere to sit. Um, and of course, this uh, this little book of just uh, 20 or so pages with his observations, the first telescopic observations of the sky. Uh, created a sensation across Europe and beyond, uh, and uh, people uh, tried to uh, buy telescopes from Galileo so they could see these things for himself. And of course, this is uh, the discovery of uh, the moons of Jupiter uh, and other uh, uh, new stars in the constellations that could not be seen in the UNAI. And indeed, in 2019, uh, I presented evidence that Galileo also discovered the first new planet since deep antiquity when he observed and recorded uh, the planet uh, Neptune some 250 years before it was officially discovered uh, thanks to mathematical uh, predictions of where it should be found. Uh, so, let us now remind ourselves of what the moon looks like. Uh, and I should say a, a point of order, um, the name of Earth's natural satellite is moon, not the moon, in that you don't say the Jupiter or the Venus. So really you shouldn't put the article in front of moon, you should just say moon, not the moon, because it's name is moon. You can all forget, so don't worry. Uh, so this is a very nice image of moon. Oh, Taken from the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, an up-close, high-resolution uh, image. Um, but uh, those of you who are familiar with the night sky uh, will feel vaguely uncomfortable about this uh, because it's clearly wrong. <laughs> Namely, it's upside down. Uh, and shocking northern hemisphere bias. <coughs> so I've corrected uh, the uh, image for you to show what it looks like from the southern hemisphere. Oh, I had to correct the logo as well. Um, <laughs> the southern hemisphere view. Now this was this image was taken uh, from space, from orbit around uh, around the moon, uh, and so it's a very high resolution image uh, with uh, features down as small as uh, half a meter visible if you if you blow it up. But uh, we have a, a very uh, gifted uh, PhD student who just started with us uh, who took this picture uh, a, few, uh, a couple of weeks ago when the moon was full from out the front of the School of Physics using one of the telescopes uh, we use in the Telescopes in Schools program. Uh, and using some sophisticated computer software, uh, he was able to stack various images together uh, and create this marvellous image of the of moon as seen from the School of Physics. Uh, uh, it's an extraordinarily uh, good result. That's what it's like in state-of-the-art telescopes in orbit around the moon. Uh, around the moon. Uh, and here it is 
uh, from the surface of the Earth outside the school of physics. Now, uh, it's fairly obvious uh, that because of the relative position of Earth and Moon in their respective orbits around the Sun, uh, the, uh, the, moon, the Moon exhibits phases as it waxes and wanes. This shows uh, the appearance over uh, a month. And uh, this uh, rocking backwards and forwards uh, that you see here um, is a consequence of the fact that the orbit of the Moon is not in the same plane as the orbit of the Earth. Uh, and so when it's at the highest point above the Earth's orbit, you can see a little bit uh, of the top of the Moon that's normally not visible. And when it's at the lowest point, you can see a little bit of the south pole of the Moon that's normally not visible. Uh, and uh, all of this uh, is readily explained uh, from uh, either the Copernican or the Ptolemaic uh, models. Now, uh, for the first time, uh, starting in the early 60s and then with increasing resolution, uh, the so uh, oh, yeah, I should have mentioned that, of course, uh, as you notice here, uh, apart from that uh, bobbing motion due to the plane of, uh, of the Moon's orbit, uh, the Moon always keeps the same face towards the Earth because uh, the time it takes the Moon to orbit about its axis once is the same as the time it takes to orbit around the Earth. And so we call this the uh, near side, but the, the Moon also has a far side, which is pointed permanently away from the Earth. And so it wasn't until artificial satellites went there and took photographs of the far side that a full picture of the Moon emerged. Now, what was startling about the pictures of the far side is the almost complete absence of the large, dark lunar seas, as they were called, uh, and instead we see an almost uniform distribution of craters. So we now understand that those dark features uh, that we call the lunar seas on the near side are volcanic plains. Volcanic uh, lava has come up through cracks in the crust created by massive uh, meteorite impacts spread out and, and filled, the, uh, filled the surface and smoothed it all out because it seems that the crust of the moon is much thinner on the side that faces the Earth compared to the side that faces away from the Earth and hence the role of volcanism is much less. So this is the first effect that, or the second effect the Earth has had on the moon. The first effect is to slow its rotation down so it's in a uh, 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 phase lock with the, the length of the day on the moon is the same as the length of the month. But also it's caused, uh, the Earth's gravity has caused a distortion of the crust of the moon. So the crust is thinner and more prone to volcanism on the near side compared to the far side. So with that very fast introduction, which I'm sure hasn't told you anything you don't already know, let me now describe some peculiarities of the earth moon system. So first of all, if you look across our solar system, there are lots of moons in orbit around the various planets. So here's a rogues, rogues gallery to scale of various moons. And you can see that uh, Earth's moon over here uh, is pretty big uh, compared to all the other moons in the solar system. There are a few that are bigger, but Earth's moon is right up there uh, as one of the biggest moons in the solar system. It's even more dramatic if you line up all the moons, uh, even with a few planets thrown in. So here we are. Here's, uh, here's the moon down here. It's outclassed by some of the uh, Galilean moons in orbit around uh, uh, Jupiter and uh, one Titan from Saturn. But it's, uh, you know, it's like the third or fourth biggest uh, moon on this uh, diagram. Uh, and notice that uh, uh, I've even included the object formerly known as the planet, uh, Pluto, on, on this scale. So Pluto is even smaller uh, than our moon. So that's, uh, that's a remarkable peculiarity that our planet should have such a large moon. And indeed, if you go out into space and take a photograph looking back, you can see the scale of the Earth's moon very dramatically. So here is a picture uh, taken by the Galileo spacecraft on its way to Jupiter. 
that did a very complex slingshot manoeuvre of Venus and Earth a few times to pick up enough speed uh, to get to Jupiter in a reasonable time. And here it is looking back at where it was launched. And I chose this particular image from the database because that's Australia down there uh, <laughs> pointing towards the moon. Uh, you can also uh, go further afield. Uh, this image here is what you would see from orbit around Mars with a telescope looking back to the Earth-Moon system. Uh, this image here is uh, taken from a very lonely position, namely in orbit around the planet Mercury with the sun behind you looking out towards the orbit of the Earth. And again, you can see the double planet, the Earth-Moon system. So, you know, if there were... Uh, external observers on the planets of the solar system looking at our planets it would really be special compared to all the other planets in the solar system which were not accompanied by such a large object. Uh, and finally, this uh, recent image is from the, uh, the Chinese uh, moon lander from the uh, mothership uh, looking back from the far side of the moon towards the Earth, uh, showing that... Uh, of course, the, the, the moon is very close, so it's big, and the Earth is far away. But again, it shows a dramatic representation of the, the double planet. Now, as a consequence of all this uh, information, uh, and one further very important piece of in information, namely that the rocks of the moon uh, are almost identical in composition and structure to the rocks of the Earth, uh, Gradually, theories have been developed to explain the origin of the moon. And so it's now generally accepted, uh, but with a few uh, updates that are, have occurred just in the last year or so, that our moon came from a massive impact in the uh, early uh, stage of the solar system where the proto-Earth was, uh, was, uh, was hit by uh, a proto planet that uh, intersected with the surface of the Earth in this dramatic uh, Earth uh, artist's impression uh, that, that was about the size of Mars. Now, uh, when you do the calculations on uh, all the uh, possible parameters uh, for such a collision and then the condensation of all the debris into uh, the Earth and the Moon, um, it doesn't quite add up. And it doesn't quite add up because there's another peculiarity of the Earth-Moon system, namely that the, uh, the angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system is shared between the Earth, which is spinning about its axis, and just to remind you about angular momentum, uh, this is a spinning top, which is now uh, carrying a lot of angular momentum, and uh, so there's a lot, it's storing a lot of momentum and energy as a result of the spin, Whoops. and then it processes as it slows down. And 13% uh, of the spin energy or the spin angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system is carried by the Moon. So that's a very unusual situation in our solar system. So all these models have to be tweaked rather dramatically to explain why it is that much of the angular momentum is carried by the Moon and not just the parent object, the Earth. And so just in the last few years, it's realized that this impact must have occurred when the Earth was still in a relatively liquid state after condensing from the protosolar nebula. So both of these objects were red hot and had deep magma oceans over the surface, which had to get cooled, that ocean's a liquid rock. And uh, when you do the uh, dynamics of the collision, then you can explain the angular momentum result that we see today. And uh, those of you who have got uh, the latest issue of Scientific American uh, will see that there's yet another tweak on top of this, where there's this new object uh, that's proposed to have formed uh, a day or so after the collision, uh, which, uh, in which the debris from the collision is distributed between the proto-Earth and the proto-Moon, Everything gets mixed up until it all settles down <laughs> under gravity and condenses into the Earth and the Moon, and that explains why the chemical composition of the rocks are essentially identical between the Earth and the Moon. But there's more peculiarities about the Earth-Moon system. 
First of all, uh, as you know, the uh, uh, Earth uh, rotates once a day, and uh, there are 365 and a quarter days, roughly, for the Earth to go all the way around the Sun. And the cycle of the phases of the Moon is on average 29.53 days. And this is extremely irritating because there are no integers here. You can't make a whole number of months fit into a year. You can't make a whole number of days fit into a month. And you can't fit a whole number of days into a year either. And so through history, many cultures have grappled with this, this series of irregularities. It would be nice if there was exactly 365 days in a year to avoid having to fudge it uh, every four years. Uh, but eventually, uh, a system was adopted uh, that gave us our uh, 12 months uh, and the, uh, in a year and months of irregular length in you know, order to fit, and then the leap year system to correct for this annoying quarter of a day left over. Uh, and when this new calendar was adopted, uh, the old calendar uh, had got out of synchronization uh, with the seasons uh, and was causing problems. Now, um, to, in order to explain uh, the orbit of the moon, uh, you have to understand uh, gravity. And it was Newton's insight uh, that uh, the same force that caused the apple to fall from the tree uh, also held the moon in its orbit. And uh, because the moon is so large and so close to the Earth, uh, not only does uh, the moon orbit the Earth, but the Earth also orbits the Moon. So let me demonstrate how that works. Steve, do I need to take the lights up so you can catch this? Uh, maybe. No, leave it as it is, I think, or turn it down, even. What? Turn it down? All right. I think it's already on the minimum. Yep. OK, so what I've got here is a, a somewhat battered uh, object from our lecture demonstrations. Uh, you can imagine this is an Earth-like Earth, and this is a Moon-like Moon, uh, and they're connected by uh, what we love in physics is a light, uh, infinitely light uh, rod. Uh, now, uh, the weight of the fat end is much greater than the weight of the uh, small end, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this across the lecture theatre and give it a bit of spin. <coughs> Not uh, spin like you're having politics, but spin like you're having business. <laughs> Real spin. Uh, I'm a bit worried I might knock the camera over, Steve. Can I just move it a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I carefully, uh, or rather Steve for me, has very carefully adjusted this little light. So the little light is exactly at the balance point uh, between the two objects of different masses. Watch what happens as I toss this across the lecture theatre with a bit of spin. You'll notice that the red light followed a perfectly parabolic trajectory. That's not a word for it. <laughs> uh, because that, that is called the centre of mass of my two-object system. I mean, uh, sometimes it's, uh, uh, it's more fun if you um, uh, set the... Light here too. Make sure I'm off. Maybe that switch goes. We can do that later. Okay, let me throw it back the other way. Uh, so, give it a bit of spin. Oh, excellent parabolic trajectory through the lecture theatre. Um, so, that represents the common uh, point where both objects orbit once they're in free fall. And you can calculate the centre of mass of the Earth-Moon system. It's called the Barry Centre. And given the mass of the Moon, the mass of the Earth, uh, that Barry Centre turns out to be 4,670-odd kilometres from the centre of the Earth towards the Moon. So the Moon's right over there at the moment. So it's, it's just down there beneath us at distance 1,707 kilometres. That is the location of the point, the common point, where both Earth and the Moon orbit each other. So, um, this orbit is quite vigorous because, as I said, about 13% of the annual momentum of the uh, system is held by the Moon rather than the Earth, which is 
the highest percentage of the angular momentum of any uh, planet in our solar system where more than 99% uh, of the angular momentum is held by the planet and a tiny amount is held by the moons. Of course, I'm excluding Pluto. So if you were watching uh, the Earth from afar, uh, you would see that the Earth travels through space in its orbit around the Sun following an oscillating path as it wobbles backwards and forwards pulled by the Moon. So we can see the Moon orbiting the Earth and the Earth orbiting the Moon and it's only the Barry Centre, the centre of mass, that follows the circular orbit around the Sun. I, since I keep mentioning the object formerly known as a planet, namely Pluto, I should show uh, the, the pluto Charon system, where Pluto has this extremely large moon, and the Barry Centre, the centre of mass for the pluto Charon system, is out in space above the surface of Pluto. So Pluto executes this small orbit, while its heavy moon executes this large orbit in their mutual gravitational pull. Now there's another, even more remarkable story about the Earth-Moon system. When you look up at the sky and uh, look at the moon, you can cover it with your finger held at arm's length, roughly. And remarkably, when the sun is up, don't do this, just take my word for it, because I keep this experiment under controlled physics conditions. You can do the same with the sun. The sun is very big, but it's very far away. The moon is very small, but it's relatively close. And it turns out the size of the moon is almost the same as the size of the sun in the sky as a result of the perspective. And in fact, because the moon's orbit is not perfectly circular, and it's sometimes it's far from the Earth, and sometimes it's closer to the Earth, although the range is very small, the size of the Earth that you can see in the sky spans the size of the sun. And this is truly a staggering coincidence. Because as we'll see in a minute, the radius of the moon's orbit has been changing with time. And so this is a unique, unique and privileged time in the history of life on Earth. Don't waste it. <laughs> but this and other reasons. Because in a few billion years, the moon will be too small to cover the sun. And a few billion years ago, the moon was so big, total eclipses lasted for ages. To help explain how eclipses work, and why they seem to be very irregular, but they actually follow a remarkably smooth period, uh, imagine this. Here's a pond with a beach ball floating in the middle of it, and a duck. And the duck is paddling around in a circle in orbit around the beach ball. Also in the pond is a flying fish. And the flying fish is executing orbits around the duck. <laughs> and you can see these two splashes where it comes out of the water and it splashes back into the water, swims along under the water and then jumps out again. So this is the sun, the moon and the earth. The surface of the pond represents the plane of Earth's orbit. The orbit of the flying fish represents the orbit of the moon, which is inclined a little bit to the uh, Earth orbit around the sun. You can draw a line between these two splashes in the plane of the Earth's orbit. And when that line points to the sun, it's possible for the flying not the flying fish, it's possible for the moon to pass between the Earth and the Sun. And that line processes around the Earth as a result of the wobble of the, Earth's, of the moon's orbit every 18.6 years or so. So therefore, every 18.6 years you have an eclipse season where the line of nodes, as it call, is called, it points towards the Sun and it's possible to have an eclipse. But when the line of nodes is not pointing to the Sun, it's not possible for the moon to pass between the Earth and the Sun, and so no eclipses are possible. So here's another more scientific diagram without any fish or ducks uh, that shows an example where the line of nodes is pointing towards the Sun, 
and then six months later, it's pointing towards the sun again, and so you could have eclipses of the moon and the sun over here, and over here six months apart, but at other times in the 18-year cycle, uh, no eclipses are possible. Shadows can't be set. And of course, solar eclipses, where the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, are quite rare and spectacular, and there was one just last week, I think, visible from South America. Um, and you can uh, watch a solar eclipse from the International Space Station, and you can see the shadow of the moon passing over the surface of the Earth. So everybody standing within that black shadow sees the sun completely blocking, being completely blocked by the moon over a diameter of about 100 kilometres. It's completely blocked. And if you're further away from the centre of the shadow, you see the sun being partially blocked by the moon. And if you're out here, it stays all the daylight and you don't know anything about the eclipse. You can't see it. But because of this staggering coincidence that when the moon is far from the Earth in its elliptical orbit, it's too small to cover the sun, it's possible to have what's called a ring of fire eclipse where the moon is blocking the sun, but because it's not big enough to completely block it, you see this ring of, ring of the sun around the edge of the moon, and I reckon that would be even more spectacular than the total eclipse, although that's pretty spectacular from the one I've seen. Uh, here's another one, uh, as uh, the, the ring of fire occurred uh, as the uh, sun and the moon were setting, uh, the moon drifted across uh, the field of view, and I, I would say this must have been, uh, you know, from the early people before they fully understood the geometry of the solar system, seeing something like this must have been truly astounding. You think, what, the, what are the gods doing? <laughs> and then have to make up all sorts of stuff to explain. Uh, of course, the Earth-Moon system allows uh, the Earth, to, uh, the Moon, to pass through the shadow of the Earth. But because the Earth has got a uh, thick atmosphere, uh, you get a lot of uh, refraction of the sunlight through the atmosphere of the Earth, so basically you see uh, not a perfectly dark shadow of the Earth on the Moon, you see this uh, blood red colour from the, the sunsets and the sunrise that's coming through the atmosphere of the Earth. But you can see that the shadow of the Earth on the Moon has got a curved edge. And so anyone who's ever seen a lunar eclipse knows that they have to be standing on an object which is round. <laughs> Because otherwise the shadow would not be round. And it doesn't matter what time of the year or the geometry of the edge of the shadow is always round. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tides. Tides. Tides as another peculiarity of the Earth-Moon system because the Earth is so big it, ex it uh, exercises a very high, strong gravitational force on the Earth. Now, just, uh, just a reminder that uh, the Earth spins in an anti-clockwise direction when seen from directly above the North Pole. Uh, I won't use the South Pole as a reference point here because it gets too confusing. Uh, but anyway, so above the North Pole, you look down on the Earth and you see it spinning in an anti-clockwise direction. So you can see Australia, uh, Melbourne, it gets dark in Melbourne uh, before it gets dark in Perth, which you, which you already know, uh, as it spins. So, and that happens you know, once a day, obviously. So, uh, this was well known, obviously. The length of the year was well known. Um, and uh, the, the length of a uh, month was well known, and uh, people figured that all of that stuff must have something to do with the rise and fall of the tides. But nobody really figured it out uh, until relatively recently. Galileo had some <laughs> ideas. He said, OK, um, we know the Earth rotates once a day, uh, and here at the latitude of Melbourne, uh, that means the ground moves at about 1,670 kilometres an hour in order to go all the way around in one day. So the, and, and it's a, a bit faster at the equator. So these arrows represent the speed of the Earth, seen from, uh, of the surface of the Earth, seen from above the North Pole as it rotates once a day. But Galileo knew for the first time, with the heliocentric model of the solar system, 
that the Earth also orbits the Sun. And it orbits pretty fast. So now we've got three velocity vectors. The two red ones are from the daily rotation of the Earth and the very large yellow one from the annual uh, revolution of the Earth around the Sun. So uh, since all parts of the Earth orbit together, fortunately it doesn't fall apart, we can add those yellow vectors to the red vectors to get the actual speed of the surface of the Earth in those two points, and that gives us these two green vectors. Uh, the top one is shortened a little bit because the two vectors are in an opposite direction, and the bottom one is lengthened because the two vectors are in the same direction. Now, Galileo knew that it was only the relative speed of uh, different points on an object which are important, and so we can subtract the top one from the bottom one and say that the surface of the Earth is moving slowly up there, and the uh, surface of the Earth is moving very quickly uh, down there. And so he said, OK, so now the water of the Earth has to go fast when it's down here, and then 12 hours later, it has to go slow when it's up there as a result of all those vectors being added up. And he made observations of barges, not a very good picture, it's the best I could find, that carried water uh, down the canals uh, in northern Italy. And he noticed when a water barge stopped at the quay, uh, from its original leisurely speed until it stopped, the water of the barge sloshed backwards and forwards as a result of the change in speed from when it was moving to when it was stopped at the key. So he figured that these, this effect was also what caused the tides. As the water in the ocean went from its fast position to the slow position 12 hours later, it should slosh backwards and forwards and because of the complexity of the coastline and the harbours and everything, this would cause the water level to go up and down. Uh, then the data came in from the Atlantic coast, because the Mediterranean is a terrible place for observing tides because of the complex uh, geometry of the ocean, of the sea, uh, where the tides were very regular and the high tide advanced by one hour uh, a day. Uh, it was very difficult to explain in this model, and so eventually it tried not to work. It needed a more sophisticated explanation for tides. And it, so really it wasn't until the uh, 18th century that the tides were explained satisfactorily. So let me explain. Uh, Steve, can I get the um, camera on the uh, drum, please? So let me just set up to explain this. Uh, here is uh, the Earth, and I've just drawn uh, roughly, say, the monthly orbit of the Earth around the Earth uh, for simplicity's sake. Now, uh, the speed an object moves in its orbit depends how far away it is from the object it's orbiting. Uh, and the closer you are, okay, can we uh, put it up? Uh, hopefully, we've got it. Maybe uh, set the lights to full so you can see what's going on. So I've got a uh, simple uh, simulation of what's going on here. Uh, and I want to illustrate how things, when they're far apart, orbit slowly, and when they're close together, they orbit quickly. Excellent. So here's the, uh, here's a heavy object, and there's a light object which I'm going to set in orbit around it, and I'm, I'm using a geometrical model for the gravitational interaction. Notice if I set this orbiting... Oh, 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 it escaped. <laughs> <laughs> the escape if I set this orbiting far away, it doesn't go very fast as it orbits around the central object. But notice as it, as it approaches the central object, it gets faster and faster and faster, so that actually when it's close, it has to go really fast until oh, the inevitable happens and friction causes it to burn up in the atmosphere. So far away is slow, and as you get closer and closer, the gravitational field gets stronger and it orbits faster. Thanks, Steve. That, uh, you'll see that blue ball in a minute. So uh, there we are. The Earth orbiting moon. Whoa. Yeah, maybe go back one notch. Uh, so here is 
the Earth orbiting the Moon. But the Earth is big, and uh, the seas are not rigidly attached to the Earth. They can move around of their own volition. And so the sea, the water in the sea that's closest to the Moon wants to orbit fast. The water in the sea, which is far from the Moon, wants to orbit slow, as you just saw in this demonstration. And so therefore, the water in the sea to, that's under the Moon is trying to go in advance of the planet itself, and the water in the sea far from the Moon is lagging behind and has to be dragged by the rest of the planet to make it uh, continue in its orbit with the average speed that they all have to follow, that one. So that means the waters of the Earth bulge out from the centre of the Earth as a result of the gravitational pull of the Moon. But, as I've explained, the Earth rotates once a day. And it takes a month for the Earth to go around the Moon, or conversely, a month for the Moon to go around the Earth. Therefore, instead of bulging, pointing towards the Moon, as you'd expect, the rotation of the Earth actually pushes the the uh, bulges in the sea forward a little bit. And the Earth rotates under that bulge once a day. And so that gives you the two high tides a day and two low tides a day as the Earth rotates in 24 hours and there are two bulges diametrically opposite each other. So this is the correct explanation of the tides on the Earth. But there's a problem for the moon. It's not a problem, there's a phenomenon of the moon as a consequence of this effect. Namely, that this bulge of the water is close to the moon compared to the bulge on the opposite side of the Earth. Consequently, there's a pull of gravity between that bulge, greatly exaggerated by the way, it's only about a metre or two, uh, depending on local geometry, it's not uh, half the diameter of the Earth. Uh, but that bulge has a gravitational uh, effect on the Moon. And it tries to pull the Moon in the direction it's offset from the uh, horizontal orientation of this diagram. And that accelerates the Moon. And that gives the Moon extra energy through speed, which causes it to rise higher in the gravitational field of the Earth and correspondingly slow down as a result, so that the radius of its orbit increases. And this has been measured very carefully, 38 millimetres per year. The Moon gets further away from the Earth. And this has been carefully measured by the uh, reflectors that were placed on the uh, Moon by the Apollo astronauts. So the radius of the Moon's orbit is increasing, and also the Earth is slowing down because as the Earth rotates under these tidal bulges, it causes friction and it dissipates some of the angular momentum of the Earth into heat and other effects, and therefore the day of the Earth correspondingly gets longer. So, an artist can give you an impression of what the Moon looked like four billion years ago after it condensed into the object it is today, uh, and raise the first tides on the newly formed Earth. So, here we are four billion years ago. There are no seas on the Moon, because all that volcanism came later. So the Moon just is starting to cool down with just craters. It's only 20,000 kilometres away instead of a uh, quarter of a million. Uh, and the length of the day on Earth is four hours. So, wow, that was a pretty high-pressure high lifestyle in those days. <laughs> now, another consequence of the uh, gravity from the Moon is that uh, the Earth's spin axis is not actually perfectly aligned with the plane of the orbit of the Moon. It's offset by about 23 degrees. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, we have a spinning top. We're just about ready to go to we have a spinning top represented by the Earth, which is spinning uh, at an angle compared to the plane where the Moon is exerting most of its gravitational pull. And so the Moon is trying to straighten up this bulge. But as you saw from the spinning top down here, 
where the pull of gravity from the Earth is trying to tip this over, the angular momentum resists, whoop, 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 I nearly fell over there, uh, resists it being tipped over, but as it slows down, the resistance to being tipped over goes away and eventually it starts to wobble and then it, it, it crashes. So the Earth wobbles as a result of the pull of the Moon and it causes the rotation axis of the Earth to process around in a circle once every 26,000 years. Now, this snapshot, uh, this impression, shows summer in Australia, which, as everybody knows, occurs in January. But 13,000 years from now, summer will occur in July. And so the July lectures will be a summer program. <laughs> and it'll be much nicer. So if you don't like coming out on a freezing cold winter night in Melbourne, the precession of the Earth's rotation axis will bring it into summer just 13,000 years from now. <laughs> but that, by the way, means that the, the uh, seasons gradually slip through the year. Obviously, it takes 13,000 years for the seasons to slip six months through the year. I have to give you a personal note that uh, my star sign is Gemini. And uh, naturally, I ran the planetarium simulations to see which constellation the sun was in, and I was born a long time ago. And it wasn't in Gemini, it was in a different constellation, I think it was in Virgo. This allowed me to extrapolate back when the star sign system was invented. Because the star signs no longer align with the position of the sun in the star sky when you were born. <coughs> there are errors that have crept in because of this effect. So I contacted my friends who like to believe in this sort of stuff. <laughs> and I offered to redo their horoscopes on the basis of the latest physical principles. <laughs> Guess how that ended. <laughs> right, see, so, uh, the moon is covered in pop marks, and it took a long time to realize that these were not volcanoes, but they were craters. And it's possible to extrapolate back, count the craters, look at the overlapping craters, and realize that uh, the moon has uh, kept a faithful record of the uh, meteorites in the solar system. There was a massive uh, uh, series of uh, meteors in the early four and a half billion years ago as the planets were forming. Then there was a lull, and then there was this late heavy bombardment faithfully recorded on the surface of the moon, and then not much has happened since. However, this was an eclipse of the moon recorded a couple of months ago uh, by uh, observers in North America, and while they were photographing the uh, eclipse of the moon, a meteorite obligingly collided with the moon and created this flash of light. Now, all of the craters on the moon are more or less circular. And this is against common sense, because if you, uh, this would sort of imply that all the meteorites that impacted with the moon must have dropped straight down at right angles to the surface. And if there was a slight angle between the incident meteorite and the lunar surface, surely you'd get an elliptical crater. Well, this is uh, because hum humanity doesn't really understand the difference between kinetic energy and momentum. Uh, when I, a long time ago, got interviewed by Philip Adams on Late, late Night Live, he wanted to know why E equaled MC squared. <laughs> okay, so I didn't have enough time. But I said, it basically arises because the amount of oomph an object carries as it moves through space is the same no matter which direction you go in. I don't think he liked it, but he didn't know what oomph was anyway. <laughs> so I said oomph is how fast it's going and how heavy it is. Light objects moving fast have as much oomph as a heavy object moving slow. Uh, and that, so uh, the amount of oomph goes as in proportion to the speed. But the amount of energy goes in proportion to the speed squared. Now, the TAC had a wipeout five campaign a few years ago, saying that there's a big difference between doing 60 kilometers an hour and 65 kilometers an hour. It's not a trivial difference. 
I should have said one of 20%, because 20% is the amount of extra energy you have when you're doing 65 kilometers an hour instead of 60 kilometers an hour, because the energy goes as the square of how fast you're going, and it's the energy which causes the crater, not the momentum. So I've plotted up here uh, the momentum on the horizontal axis, which is uh, more or less the speed of the object per kilogram, and the kinetic energy per kilogram on the vertical axis. Here's a car, here's an aeroplane, and here is the orbiting Earth. 450 million joules per kilogram as a result of the Earth orbiting the Sun. And of course, if you're going to collide with any objects drifting through space, that's the amount of energy per kilogram in those objects. Are we ready? So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time here tonight, we're going to test our high-speed camera. And I'm going to try and create a crater for you using an object which has an enormous amount of kinetic energy, namely the shot put. <laughs> Steve, are we ready? Wait a second. Okay. I've been drifting around in space for four billion years, so I've got plenty of fun. <laughs> okay, so I'll do a small one first, right, just to warm up. Yeah, right. Okay, here we go. Uh, just a small meteorite impacting with the moon. Special moon dust here for you tonight. For Bunnings, $20. $20. <laughs> <laughs> satisfactory cratering event caused by this small object. You can see the, uh, the uh, kinetic energy, the impact is translated into the kinetic energy uh, of the uh, debris being ejected from the crater. But I can't give these objects the same ratio of kinetic energy to momentum that you'd find in a typical astronomical collision. Okay, there it goes. Oh, very nice. All right, it's time to do the big one now, Steve. Okay, set everything back to zero. Let me know when you're ready to go. Ready? Yep, ready. Set. Go. which are the ionized nuclei of hydrogen atoms with a, a small admixture of alpha particles, uh, which are the nuclei of uh, helium uh, atoms and heavier, heavier elements besides. Uh, and these cross space between the sun and uh, uh, the moon and rain down straight onto the lunar surface. We don't have uh, charged particles reaching the surface of the Earth uh, because of our thick atmosphere protects us uh, from this sort of radiation. And these particles are very energetic, and they can penetrate through the thin walls of spaceships, they can penetrate through the skin of the astronauts, they can penetrate into the electronic components of space probes that have to be specifically hardened against this sort of radiation to avoid them failing. 
this uh, charged particle radiation changes the structure of the rocks on the surface of the moon. Um, and uh, some of the energy from the particle, the charged particle uh, radiation changes, uh, causes light to be emitted from the rocks on the surface of the moon, and the colour of the light depends on the composition of the rocks. So here we see green light and red light emitted during solar flares when the iron irradiation is particularly intense, which was captured by special telescopes. Now, this means that um, there are, uh, uh, because of the effect these ions have on the surface layer of the, uh, of the moon, it actually causes the surface of the moon uh, to become lighter than uh, over time as a result of the uh, irradiation. And uh, this means that there are features on the moon which are determined by the iron irradiation from the sun causing changes to the surface composition of the moon. Okay, we, we, can, uh, we can do it, yeah. Um, and these features are affected by the magnetism of the moon. Do I have to turn up the uh, acceleration voltage? All right, so here I haven't got a beam of charged particles for you. I've just got a beam of electrons, but the principles are the same. And um, here I've got some uh, magnetic uh, rocks. And although uh, these have been in the School of Physics for a very long time, the magnetism has gradually faded away. But you can just see very subtle changes to the direction of the beam of charged particles as a result of the magnetism from the rock. This is a piece of lodestone. But here I've got a fairly different magnet. Uh, which has got a very strong magnetic field, and you can see it will deflect the uh, beam of charged particles, which in this case is electrons. Now, this was used uh, for great effect, thanks Steve, uh, in uh, 2001, a space odyssey, also released in 1969, where um, the Tycho magnetic anomaly was discovered uh, from the uh, strange magnetic field, and this was very deliberately billions of years ago, I mean, you, you know the story, they dug it up and sent the message to Jupiter. But, that's fantasy, this is fact. If you look uh, at some places on the moon, you can see these swirls, and these swirls occur when the magnetic field of buried stuff, naturally occurring magnetic rocks like this lodestone, has deflected the iron stream from the sun away from those patches of the surface, leaving them lighter compared to the heavily damaged stuff from the iron irradiation. So these are magnetic swirls due to the iron irradiation from the sun, not possible on Earth. So, finally, let me say a few words now about going to the moon, having covered the physics of the Earth and the system. Still today, if you line up all the rockets that have flown in the intervening 50 years, the Saturn V moon rocket remains the absolute champion for lifting stuff off the Earth by an enormous margin. It seems staggering that over 50 years of development, it has never been invented. And this in some ways represents the fundamental limit, limit of chemical fuels. Now, I've had the opportunity to visit some of the places where these rockets were made. Uh, this is a visit to Cape Canaveral in 1988. There's a spare Saturn V on display. There's the vertical assembly building. <laughs> I'm not sure who that young man is. <laughs> uh, that's where the Apollo rockets were uh, fabricated. There's all sorts of giant artifacts left lying around. At this point, it was only 20 years earlier that the Apollo missions took place. Uh, when I was there, they just moved uh, the space shuttle Atlantis onto the pad. And I was hanging around, you know, launch it, launch it. But unfortunately, there were problems and I had to go before it was launched. So that was, that was a pity. But uh, that's very feeble compared to the Saturn V from 20 years earlier, 50 years ago. The Saturn V, with its uh, first stage of five F1 engines burning uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen, according to the uh, NASA website, generated over 180 million horsepower. <coughs> 
not exactly sure what a horsepower is, but I looked it up, and it turns out it's 135 gigawatts. Now, every power station in Australia running flat out will generate about 45 gigawatts. So what you're looking at there is more than, nearly three times the total energy generated by every power station in Australia being harnessed to lift this uh, rocket into orbit. Uh, here is at the Houston Space Centre, you can see one of the F1 engines uh, that were used as part of the cluster of five in the first stage. These engines cannot be made today because the skills needed to make them have now been lost. Each of these engines was made by hand with skilled welders. And they were not, there was very little machinery used. It was all done by hand. And the people who had those skills have now retired and moved on. So the F1 engine could not readily be reproduced. Here's another shot uh, at the Houston Space Centre. This was the uh, control room, it's very dark, where the Apollo missions were commanded from, uh, which has just recently been restored. Now, the F1 engine is a remarkable thing. It takes fuel out of the tank, the kerosene and liquid oxygen, the oxidizer, and it runs them through an enormous turbo pump that squashes the fuel as fast as possible into the combustion chamber of the engine, where it ignites and expands at an enormous rate, and then it is ejected out the back of the engine to provide thrust. And this is the, where the magic happens, where the heat and the internal kinetic energy is converted into momentum to propel the vehicle upwards and onwards. And in order to do that, the turbo pumps themselves uh, had to be extraordinarily uh, engineered. So I like to think of the four stages as the slurp, sucking the fuel in, compressing it into the engines, then there's the roar as it ignites, and then the whoosh as it goes out the back. <laughs> Uh, in case um, I've got any of my second year thermal uh, physics students, you'll have a more scientific approach to analyzing this thermal inside. And it's a remarkable thing that this was made to work. First of all, there was a mixture of chemicals ejected into the combustion chamber that spontaneously burst into flames before the oxygen and the kerosene were turned on. And uh, they were really worried that these uh, engines would be difficult to ignite because part of the burn is used to power the pumps, which drive the fuel into the engines, which can't start until the engines are burning. Hence the use of these uh, spontaneous combustion from these two other chemicals to get them running. And you can see the exhaust from the turbo pump as the rocket takes off as a dark shroud of partially burned kerosene surrounding the bright light from the burning kerosene and the oxygen in the stoichiometric ratio. So a substantial amount of the exhaust is coming from the pumps that were pumping the fuel into the engine. And here is an Apollo 11 F1 engine recovered from the bottom of the uh, Atlantic by uh, the uh, guy who did Amazon, does Amazon. Uh, he found it and recovered it. Uh, now, a long time ago, 25 years ago, in one of the previous July lectures, someone asked me how it is in space where everything's weightless because they're falling, particularly falling towards the moon in the case of the Apollo astronauts, the liquid fuels in the tanks can be pumped out into the engines, but surely the fuel is just floating in the tank. So I know it's 25 years late, but I've got the answer to that question. <laughs> Here is the uh, third stage of the Saturn moon rocket filmed from a movie camera actually using fed ink and film and was recovered after it crashed to Earth, showing the upper stage being uh, separated from the second stage. Uh, and you can see there are small solid rocket motors around the edge that pushes it away. Uh, and that, uh, that forward acceleration causes the liquid fuel to drop into the bottom of the tanks, whereupon the liquid fuel motor can be ignited. And because this is already in space, uh, the exhaust gases expand into the vacuum of space. Uh, down on the uh, surface of the moon, the lunar module used a very simple engine, uh, two chemicals that uh, ignite spontaneously in contact, no pumps, it just used a tank of liquid helium to push the fuel into the engine. So it was extremely simple with the minimum of moving parts. Uh, and of course there were engines in the descent stage and there was a, a separate engine, the same fuel in the ascent stage. Uh, and 
having inspected <coughs> this partially constructed lunar module, I can say these astronauts had to be extraordinarily brave. This is made of very light gauge a, uh, stainless steel <coughs> sheet, almost a foil with all these stiffeners. It had to be extremely light. And the engineers were worried that uh, in the cold of the lunar surface, after the landing engine burned out and the heat washed through the craft, that the fuel would freeze and they'd not be able to get off again. But the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has taken photographs of the Apollo 11 landing site, and you can indeed see the uh, landing stage that remained on the moon. You can see dark lines where the astronauts have disturbed the bleached lunar surface from the iron irradiation from the sun to reveal the dark <coughs> material underneath. And you can see their footprints around the landing site from lunar orbit. Uh, I just am not trying to say anything about this, but uh, there was a plan that if the engines didn't ignite to take them back into orbit, there was this emergency lunar escape system uh, that they could have unfolded, which was never implemented. Uh, from the side of the lunar module, they pumped some of the fuel into these tanks. There's no guidance system. The astronauts just have to go like this, steer it, and, and just navigate by eye. But it was never implemented. Uh, Apollo uh, 12 and the Surveyor Lander is, are also visible from lunar orbit. Uh, the Surveyor, and you can see the astronauts uh, footprints going very far uh, from the landing vehicle down into the crater to recover some of the parts of the robotic lander that preceded it by a couple of years. You can see the footprints heading out here. Um, and this uh, Surveyor Lander was uh, to test that uh, uh, the surface of the moon would support a vehicle had a uh, iron beam analysis system similar to the one in my laboratory, which fills several floors, but was all compacted down to <coughs> just a pan a few centimetres in diameter. And not to forget the pilot. Uh, the pilot was a critical part of the whole thing, and as, uh, Armstrong's unique uh, personal features, his extreme calmness under high pressure, uh, was essential for the success of the mission. Uh, this is the Apollo uh, 11 uh, command module at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. Uh, just after this picture was taken, uh, one of the uh, staff opened the uh, hatch and I was able to stick my head inside the command module. It was a very emotional moment, I can tell you. Uh, oh, this was the uh, lunar receiving lab where the astronauts were put into quarantine after they were fished out of the Pacific Ocean and they successfully returned. And these white footprints were painted by the, uh, uh, the Navy uh, crew as the first steps Armstrong took on the Earth after stepping on the Earth. Uh, of course, in 1969, I was 11 years old, and we were sent home from school. We had a roster for those people uh, who didn't have televisions to join the people who did have televisions. And this is the Jamison family, AWAD, which went on TV. But in 1970, one, that was superseded by the adventure starts and the new beauty of space age electronics. And Apollo is being used to advertise this uh, new technology television which used transistors in order to make the picture it's still black and white. Uh, but that brings me to the final point, the legacy of Apollo. Was Apollo 11 in 1969 the dawn of the space age? No. But there was an overlooked innovation that did change the world. This was the first time a large, complicated vehicle was controlled by an onboard computer. And for you young people today, you hardly know what life was like before computers. It was dull. <laughs> in a complicated mission where people's lives depended on it. The very first time, the first idea that a computer could be useful in this way, to control this complex machine. And it had 2,800 silicon chips with six transistors in each chip, not two billion like there is in every Pentium. And it had 78 kilobytes of core memory. 78 kilobytes! Oh, the power! <laughs> And this is Margaret Hamilton, who uh, was responsible for overseeing writing the code, which went into this computer. Here it's all being printed out. It's uh, nearly as tall as she is. But it was an enormously complex project. 
for which there were no precedents. And she said, when interviewed later, we had no choice but to be pioneers. So Apollo was the dawn of the computer age. And if we look back on the legacy of Apollo and try and look forward into the future, it stands, I would say, up there with Stonehenge. It took two and a half thousand years to build with this large workforce, and it consumed between 0.2 and 2% of the UK population to build. And what an extravagance at a time where the literacy rate was uh, actually, zero. Uh, where, the, where the vaccination rate was um, zero. Why didn't they attend to those pressing social problems instead of spending all this effort building Stonehenge? Well, we're glad they did. The pyramids, 30 years to build, 10,000 workers, 0.5% of the population of Egypt in 2500 BC, and it stood the test of time as a mark of the civilization of the time. I was just at the Milana, uh, Milan Duomo, very impressive building, 600 meters to build, 300 workers, about 0.03% of the northern Italian population, 400 AD. And that brings us to Apollo 11. 10 years to build, 400,000 workers across the US and elsewhere, 0.2% of the US population worked either directly or indirectly on this mission. And it's left a monument that will outlast Stonehenge. It will outlast the pyramids. It will outlast most of the buildings of Western civilization. The monuments left by the Apollo missions on the moon will endure for millions and millions of years. In geological ages in the future, the 20th century will have left an enduring monument to the brilliance of our civilization and the power that science has given us. That brings me to the end. Thank you.